Hello and welcome to lecture number six out of eight in this lecture series on CCNA4 with me, Joachim Kjærestnod from the University of Skövde. Uh, and being at chapter six, uh, we are actually getting towards the business end of this last course in in the CCNA videos that, I, that I'm going to do. And the topic at hand today is quality of service, which is a fully theoretical uh, chapter where we will look at uh, quality of service overview. Uh, what we'll look at is basically transmission quality, traffic characteristics, and some queuing algorithms. Uh, I we will also look at some quality of service models and implementation techniques, but we are not going to actually do something, so there will not be so much context-based microtraining in this video. It will rather just be me talking for a while uh, and you hopefully listening. Uh, so let's get down and dirty, and I just want to summarize quality of service in in one single picture. Uh, because what I want you to know, the mindset that we need to have before we go into this lecture, is that as networks has developed and become more and more converged, there are also uh, more and more different types of traffic that are on the on our networks. Like we have the old traditional data traffic, which might be web visits, uh, email financial transaction, voice, but, but, but we also have voice over IP, video, other uh, sensitive real-time systems, and so on and so forth. And what we need our networks to uh, be able to manage is that we need, our, we need our networks to be able to prioritize traffic so that we know that uh, some types of traffic are getting a higher priority because they basically need it. So, for instance, if we use voice over IP, we are dependent on a high capacity network so that the talk that we the talk that we're talking is fluent and the same goes if we want to have a video meeting or if we want to watch video and so on and so forth and um, whereas with some other types of traffic we may not be uh, be that uh, that concerned with speed we're more concerned with just making sure that stuff gets to where the stuff needs to be and this will be the case with uh, very asynchronous communication types like uh, like email and so on and so forth. Uh, so we will talk a lot about priority in this uh, in this lecture and priority in this lecture doesn't really mean that some type of traffic is less important than something else in terms of uh, how important it is to a business. It just means that uh, high priority traffic is something that needs more bandwidth and needs it now in order for a service to to be sufficiently good. And uh, so there are a couple of threats out there to uh, to having uh, a good quality of the services that we have, and those uh, those are basically congestion, delay, jitter, and package loss. So let's just review those terms real quick. So beginning of everything, what we really need is bandwidth. We need bandwidth so that we can transfer data from one place to another at a high rate. So bandwidth is basically the number of bits that can be transmitted per second, um, and that would be the capacity of a device, uh, a cable, or a network. Um, while we are here, I just want to tell you that when we talk about bandwidth, we are we shouldn't only be concerned with uh, with a number that is written down on an interface or or on a cable. We usually have gigabit Ethernet ports at least on our, all of our devices. We may even have fiber or 10 gigabit Ethernet ports, but that's not everything. We also need to be concerned with the internal speed of every device. So sometimes you talk about the term backplane, which is basically how how quickly the device can shuffle data within itself. So consider a switch where we may have 48 gigabit Ethernet ports. So that is a 48 gigabit uh, device, but if it has a backplane of only like say 10 gigabytes, it cannot, uh, it can still not within itself shuffle data at high rates than 10 gigabytes. And then, well, then it's not a 48 gigabit, uh, a gigabit uh, device because if every interface is fully loaded with uh, with one gigabyte of traffic, well, then the device will choke on that pressure. Uh, so, well, that, that was a lot of words for describing what bandwidth is, which you should already know. Uh, but we also want to talk about congestion, which is basically uh, the term for what happens when the device is given a higher load than it can handle. And why do we need to know about congestion? Well, because it causes delay. Uh, and delay, uh, which is also called latency, is essentially the time it takes for a package to travel from source to destination. So there will always be some delay within a network because it takes time for those electrical signals to go from source to destination, but we want it to be uh, as low as possible. Uh, 
And something that may be even a little bit more confusing is jitter, which is basically the variation in delay of received packages. So remember that we usually have a package switch network. Within an IP traffic, a package may take different routes. It may take different amount of time to uh, to travel from one destination to another. Uh, let's say that we have a phone call or that you're watching this video that will go on for, uh, I guess, at least 15 minutes, perhaps more, I don't know yet. But it's likely that the load on the network will be different during this uh, during this duration. There may be stuff that peaks uh, for just a few milliseconds and this will call yit cause jitter because we cannot know on the destination end how long, the, uh, how long the delay for each package will be and it can even be different amounts of time so that the packages arrive out of order. Uh, and of course delay and jitter is troublesome in real time or interact uh, environments or when, when we have interactive traffic such as voice or video uh, and that is something that we need to handle. Uh, so looking a little bit more into, uh, into package loss um, and what we, uh, what we need to know here is that when congestion does occur, uh, when a device is given more than it can handle, uh, what usually happens is that a device in itself has a buffer, so it will buffer up packages and store them so that, can, uh, so that it can transmit them when it has time. But if the buffer gets full, uh, normally the package gets dropped. Um, so uh, that can be a problem depending on how we want to handle it. If we use TCP or other upper layer, layer protocols, they can cause the packages to be retransmitted. You remember with sequence numbering and everything, the, send, the receiving device will say, hey, you sent me package 1 to 100, but where is 110, 1 to 110? Um, where are those packages? You promised them to be here, but they are not, so then TCP will send them again. Uh, and retransmitted package, uh, packages will, of course, arrive out of order, or packets that are not transmitted at all, uh, are not retransmitted at all, are lost. Um, and this is something that we need to have techniques in place to handle in the way that we want to handle them. Uh, basically, we talk about UDP versus TCP, where TCP has the sequence numbering and makes sure that everything gets to where it needs to be. But that is on the cost of speed, because when we have to retransmit uh, packages, of course, it takes a little more time. They arrive out of order, so that's something that we have to handle, and so on and so forth. Uh, that is not something that we can use for, for instance, audio, because, well, when we are talking to each other, we are not interested in having words or parts of words uh, arriving like uh, seconds after when they should be there, because we'll already be somewhere else in the communication. Uh, so instead, we may we will use UDP, and then we will have to have uh, some techniques to maybe handle uh, that some bits get lost in translation. Um, but of course, if we lose too many packages or have to resend too many packages, then the quality will be reduced, and maybe audio and video won't be that useful as it was in the good old days. Um, so let's talk a little bit about modern networks. Well, modern networks are expected to handle different types of data uh, and the, these different types of data will have different needs and times of bandwidth, jitter, delay and package loss. Uh, when we talk audio, video, real-time systems, we are very interested in having stuff arrive real quickly uh, without jitter and without delay, but we may allow some package loss. On the other hand, if we do financial transactions or send emails, then we don't worry about the time too much. Uh, a few milliseconds or even seconds is very okay, but we don't want to lose any packages. Um, further, different application will behave uh, in different ways if they are allowed. So to find a way to uh, to make all of those different uh, different applications work, we need some way of controlling how they expect uh, or how they work. So let's look a little bit. Uh, let's look a little bit about this. So let's just look on some traffic types uh, in a little bit more detail. So basically the traffic types that we have in or are discussing as groups in this chapter is voice, video and data traffic. And beginning with, with voice, uh, voice uses UDP, um, making it not retransmit packages. But as we said, we don't really want that. Uh, what we should know about voice traffic is that voice traffic, when we talk using voice over IP or whatever, is usually uh, a quite predictive uh, stream of data. So we can basically know how much data that is, that is sent during the duration of a call. 
Uh, it's very sensitive to delay and loss. Uh, so in numbers, it expects a latency, or you, you want to have a latency of less than 150 uh, milliseconds to have uh, to have a good quality. You want to have jitter of less than 30 milliseconds, uh, a loss of less than 1% of the packages. And, well, Cisco says that you need uh, a bit rate of uh, 30 kilobits per second. I'm not sure how that will work in rea reality, but that is like a basic demand on what you need. Uh, so looking at video then, that is a little bit more uh, complicated. It still uses UDP and is sensitive to delay and loss. Uh, it can actually accept a little bit more latency and jitter, uh, not loss though. Uh, the thing that you need to know about video is that it actually tends to be quite unpredictable and have traffic bursts. So what this means is that while voice tends to have sort of the same requirements over the duration of, of a talk or a session, video tends to be more, uh, more prone to peaking. So it will need uh, it, it will need to uh, it, it will need to have peaks of uh, of traffic requirements. So uh, so that is actually a problem because uh, we cannot say that the average need of video is X because at times it will actually need something that is much higher than X and that is a problem. And uh, further, uh, it needs more bandwidth than voice, of course. Cisco says in the material that needs above 384 kilobits per second. I would say that the actual needs are much higher. Uh, also, you should understand that the expectations that we have on video in terms of quality, those requirements are pushed by the hour. So we already require more than we did just a couple of weeks ago or at least a couple of years ago because we want to have full HD video conferences with awesome audio and preferably we should be able to set up video conferences with a multitude of cameras from different people and we want our networks to uh, to make this all work in a very nice way. Uh, so the last traffic type then is is data uh, and data is basically anything that isn't voice or uh, or video and uh, one nice thing about it is that it's typically insensitive to loss and delay and I will say this on layer one, two and perhaps even three in the OSI model because the idea with data traffic is that you leave it up to the upper layers to uh, to retransmit if it's needed. So for instance when we look at uh, uh, when we look at uh, data traffic we leave it up to TCP or even uh, even la layer seven to uh, decide if data has to be retransmitted or not if it's lost. Uh, the thing with data traffic is that it's very unpredictable because it can basically be anything. It's very application dependent. Uh, and some applications like FTP will basically take all the resources that it, it can get. Uh, so what, we, what I want to emphasize here is that data traffic can get, uh, can get in the way of voice and video traffic. Uh, of course, the nature of the application will set the boundaries for uh, for the demands. Uh, there is a vast difference between email traffic, financial transaction, and real-time systems, um, both in terms of what bandwidth you want to give them and uh, what, how certain you need to be that everything gets from start to finish. So now we, we've been talking about the, the types of traffics and the different problems that we have with uh, Git with providing quality for different types of traffic. Um, now we will start looking at quality of service in more detail. Uh, so as we discussed in the start of this lecture, quality of service is basically about letting different types of traffic get different access to the network using some sort of prioritization. Uh, so in essence, this is done by implementing different queuing mechanisms that well, facilitates just that. So instead of just letting everything out on our network and letting all applications get whatever resources they can, uh, they can get access to, we have different algorithms to mark our traffic depending on what type of traffic it is, and then we use a queuing algorithm that uh, that decides what type of traffic that gets um, that gets the more resources. So let's go ahead and just explore some of the more commonly used uh, queuing algorithms. And what we will begin with is the simplest one, which is first in, first out, or FIFO. Uh, well, basically, FIFO is no queuing algorithm. It's just an algorithm that says that whatever data that gets in first gets out first. And this is what we do if we don't configure any quality of service, basically. So we'll just leave that and go through the uh, go on to the first uh, a little bit more intelligent queuing algorithm, which is called weighted fair, fair queuing, or WFK. Uh, 
WFQ, okay, whatever. Uh, and where the fair queuing will, is about dividing uh, incoming traffic into different queues, and each queue is giving, given a portion of the bandwidth depending on its priority. Uh, so traffic is actually classified based on different aspects, such as IP addressing, port numbering, what protocol it belongs to, what type of service it is, and so on and so forth. Uh, I will show you on a picture next. What you should know uh, is that uh, it's not supported with encryption and tunneling because those technologies will alter the package content information required by weighted fair queuing. So for instance, if you have a, a VPN tunnel or other, um, uh, yeah, let's say VPN tunnel, what will happen is that you will rewrite the uh, IP header or you will actually add a new IP header to to the original data package and then weighted fair queuing will not find those fields that it needs. So <coughs> sorry for that. So let's look at weighted fair queuing in uh, in a picture. So what is what it does is basically that you have uh, different Tra different priority classifications, as you see down here. And as you see here, traffic is coming into a device uh, and it's being classified based on what it is. So you will have, uh, in this example, four different queues, one for high prioritized traffic, medium, normal, and low, and so on and so forth. And those will be treated as buffers. And depending on the priority of the buffer, the the algorithm will send out packages in different order so as you see here the i'm colorblind but i guess purple the high priority queue is being sent out first then comes medium then comes normal then comes low and um, there is functionality in uh, in wfq that uh, that ensures that no queue will be left alone forever everything will be sent eventually but uh, if you if you are traffic that is lower prioritized, you uh, you'll have to wait your turn. Uh, so there were some problems with uh, weighted fair queuing that uh, that has been uh, met in class based weighted fair queuing or CBWFQ. I guess class based weighted fair queuing is easier for me to say. Uh, what this uh, algorithm does is basically that it extends the functionality of weighted fair queuing uh, by supported user-defined classes. So uh, using weighted fair queuing, we are left with what the algorithm says that we should have, uh, but using uh, the class-based version then, we can actually define our own class traffic and decide what priorities they should have. So traffic classes can de be defined using different criteria, such as access control lists, protocols, input interfaces, uh, and uh, a number of more uh, uh, characteristics and when you define a class you can also assign it a minimum bandwidth that it will be guaranteed during congestion so this is basically what we do to say that every queue should always have something because we don't want complete congestion in one queue uh, we can also define a queue limit and the queue limit is saying how many packets can we buffer up within this device before we start dropping packages when the queue is full if there is more incoming packages those will just be dropped so we can look at this in a picture and as you see it looks basically just the same as weighted fair queuing but we use uh, user defined classes instead of something that has been predefined uh, so there is also one last algorithm that I want to uh, to tell you about, uh, which is called low latency queuing. So uh, weighted fair queuing and class based weighted uh, uh, class based weighted fair queuing bandwidth will be shared among different queues depending on the settings that we created. Uh, and what LLQ is is essentially an additional queue that where we put high priority traffic. Uh, and when we use LLQ, the data in the uh, in the LLQ queue will be sent before any of the other queues are handled. A lot of queue in this slide. Um, and the Cisco recommendation is to only have voice traffic in the LLQ queue. So what will happen then is basically that we have our class-based weighted fair queuing for all traffic except voice. But we have our priority queue. Uh, this is like priority boarding uh, in terms of and boarding an airplane, we have our voice traffic coming into the priority queue, and what will happen is that no matter uh, no matter what order the packages enter the device in, what's, uh, the priority queue will always be emptied before the device starts working on the other queues. 
So that was it for the queuing algorithm. Good time to take a break and maybe go grab a coffee uh, if you're not up for uh, a few more slides of high-speed lecturing. Because uh, we are moving on to quality of service models. Uh, and I will actually go through these real quick. So there are a few different ways of uh, a few different models for implementing quality of service. And here we are talking about quality of service in, in a bigger context. So over a network that we may not necessarily control when we have our own network, uh, it, it's actually well, easy to, uh, to implement quality of service in the sense that we actually control the entire network. But uh, when we have to go over a network that we don't control, it becomes a, a very, very much more complicated. So the models are best effort model, integrated services, or differentiated services, where the best effort model is, well, not really an implementation, uh, as, uh, well, a quality of service is not being explicitly configured, and this is what we use when quality of service is not required. Uh, then we have uh, integrated services, which uh, will provide a very high quality of service to IT, IP packages with guaranteed delivery. And what it does is that it defines a, sing, a signal process, a process for applications to signal to the network that they require quality, uh, special quality of service for a period. And then that bandwidth should be reserved. Uh, the problem here is that uh, integrated services can severely limit the scalability of the network, and this is because we have to have this end-to-end sig uh, -end signaling process. Uh, read more about it in the material if you're interested. Uh, then we have the differentiated services, which is uh, uh, more of a high scalability and flexibility uh, method to implementing quality of service. Um, and in this case, network devices will recognize traffic classes and provide different levels of uh, quality of service to different traffic classes. So enough said about that. Now we will go into the few ending slides where we will start uh, talking about some tools for quality of service. And this is not so much about the uh, the queuing and marking uh, tools, but more about what we should do. So something that we can do is to just avoid package loss. And how do we, do we avoid package loss? Well, we can increase the link capacity. That's the obvious one. If you have a if you have a highway where uh, where there are too many cars, well, what would you do? You would you would extend the highway so that you have place for more cars. Uh, and what we want to do here is have enough bandwidth and large enough buffers so that we can handle bursts in a good way. Um, and we can also prevent congestions by not propping, by dropping low priority package, uh, packages and hope that upper level protocols will handle retransmission if it's needed. So what I'm saying here is that one way to prevent congestions for the priori pr priori prioritized traffic is to uh, just start dropping low priority traffic when, uh, when it gets too much to handle and just hope that the upper level protocols will handle retransmission as needed. Uh, so, what uh, tools do we have for, for implementing uh, quality of service? Uh, well, the first one is, of course, classification and marking tools. For any of the algorithms to work, we need to have, uh, we need to have a way of marking. Uh, and in this case, sessions of data or data flows or even packages are analyzed to determine what kind of traffic they are. Uh, once that has been determined, the packages are marked in some way. Uh, we can also use con congestion avoid avoidance tools, and here the idea is just to ensure that congestion doesn't happen at all. Uh, or we can have congestion management tools, uh, and that is basically saying, well, uh, congestion will happen eventually, uh, how do we manage it then? Uh, and I'm not going to read through all of the descriptions because it's basically what we've been talking about throughout this entire lesson. Uh, so there are a few different ways in which we can, or where we can mark traffic, uh, depending on the uh, on the tools that we use. So, for instance, or uh, the first case is that we can have uh, quality of service marking either at layer two or layer three. And the benefit of having it on layer two is, of course, that uh, we can use uh, switches for the marking, and that uh, we are uh, the marketing marking is happening regardless of what upper layer layer three protocol that is used. So if we want to have a network where uh, where we need the marking to happen regardless of whether we're using IPv4, IPv6, or Apple Talk, for instance, then we want to have layer two marking. Uh, and we and there are fields for doing this in the Ethernet frames, the Wi-Fi frames, the MPLS frames. 
Uh, we can also do the marking at uh, at layer three, then using IPv4 or IPv6, uh, and IP the, either the IP precedence or the differentiated service code point fields. Uh, so that was it for quality of service. Uh, I guess there was some Cisco specific material in this chapter. I decided to skip that because I don't think it's that interesting to go too much into details about vendor specific stuff. Uh, as uh, there was no good uh, pack tracer material or no pack tracer material at all in this chapter, so we're not going to have any practicals. Uh, if you have any questions on this lesson, leave it in the comments field and we can have the extreme community of what is it now, like five comments that I had on previous videos answered for you, or I will just go ahead and do it. So thank you for this lesson and see you next time for lesson number seven.